Welcome back to the Chainsaw Man Comparison Series. Now on episode 4, which covers chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, and one page of chapter 12. This episode capitalized on the fantastic episode 3 and in many ways surpassed it. There were some interesting approaches Mappa took during this episode. As far as what they were, well, let's get right into the comparison and find out. We start off this episode with some classic power animal brutality that's somehow surprisingly serendipitous in nature. It feels like power is the more more ragged reincarnation of Eve in these shots, and seeing Yaoi at the end reminds us just how much more selective she is about her prey than meets the eye. Heck, it's something she didn't even realize until she found herself going out of her way for her kidnapped cat. Power's dash for finding a live human is more than one of just desperation, but revelation as well. It's the point where she discovered another side to her love of blood, and it's illustrated well. It blends her real-life injury with the metaphor for her realization while literally bleeding from one scene to the next. This cut from Benjamin Foir exercises the strongest traits of what I assume is straight-ahead animation and allowed it to be held up high with outstanding compositing talent. Power's feelings and thoughts are sewn deep throughout this scene, and the effects of it perfectly replaces the manga-only depiction of Power calling Miaoi over before we see them both snuggling together. It's the sort of bliss that Power never knew that she needed and was willing to risk everything to never lose again. But as it turns out, it was a human that helped her to preserve that relationship the most. Though that pseudo human had to do quite a bit of digging just to reach power, and it certainly attracted a good amount of anime-only crows. Very respectable that Denji didn't try to cop a feel while power was out of commission. It's nice that he's following the proper fondling procedures, despite all the hell he had to raise just to get here. It's funny, Mappa actually uses the crows as an innuendo here for Denji's state of being in this regard. After he learns that he's gotten consent from power, they all start to clear out of the skies, showing the relief of him finally managing to make headway on his long-desired dream. Or at least he thought, because it probably wouldn't be the same if he couldn't do it with at least both of his hands intact. Quite the mood shift, and I love how we can see it all in Denji's face in one singular cut. Despite this being Kikunosuke Toya's first voice acting role, he really nailed it here. Another devil showing up clearly wasn't on Denji's radar, and especially not one this ugly looking. After this bad hair day of a monster violently whips Denji's arm into its stomach, that's when we'll break for the opening, and when we come back, we'll continue right along as Denji is getting prepared for the Sakuga he's about to unleash. And that's even before he starts fighting, like the little staggering he does after ripping his pull cord, or basically every single frame pertaining to the leech devil. Seriously, this thing never stops moving. It's so detailed that even the voice work is in perfect sync with its posing, something that's not easy to do for a medium when voice work is generally done last. Nice of this thing to let Denji off the hook for his looks, but as soon as he knew that that meant the death of power, he knew it needed to be done. It's him charging in to fight the Leech Devil that'll not only end out Chapter 9, but starts arguably the best fight in Chainsaw Man thus far. Plenty of people had issues with Mappa's composition of Jujutsu Kaisen, but looking at the Genga from animator Yen BM, it's clear that he's constructed it perfectly for the rest of the staff. There's always the chance that he had assistance for the layout of this cut, but one thing's for sure, he knows exactly how the background should operate around Denji. Everything else is up to the rest of the team. I don't mention it enough in these videos, but corrections and feedback go a very long long way in this industry. True, the foundation of movement is set by the key animator, but it's theorized and revised by the action director, who we'll talk about in just a second, and consistently corrected by the episode and animation directors. Not to mention all the filling and compositing that needs to take place after that. That's a lot of work, especially considering all the separately keyed elements in one scene. Watching Denji spin around may hog most of the engagement here, but there's also a lot of small animations that are muted during the composition phase. Sometimes, though, these elements are made the focus focal point, like how the camera pans to watch debris interact with the city. The layout of these cuts is extremely dynamic, and it makes us feel like a spectator that's actually there. The transitions are also incredibly seamless, especially this one right here with the smoke from the falling pole seamlessly brings us into another perspective altogether. Every technique used here reinvigorates the four starting manga panels of chapter 10 that it adapts, and isn't afraid to use choreography that would disconnect itself from the manga. However, once Denji blocks this attack right here, that's when we'll start to sync back up again. 
It's absolutely jaw-dropping that even for the most relatively still moments like this, Mappa continues to add motion that normally would have been fine without it. It's a philosophy that extends beyond just adding new representations, like how Denji ran up the devil this time, and going so far as to add little nuances where there really didn't need to be any. No one asked for a highly detailed slow-mo cut here, but Mappa graciously gave us one anyways. It's pure insanity how consistently mobile this show is, and many people are still amazed at how the show can look looks so smooth all the time despite all the assets on screen. Many people have also been quite vocal about the use of 3D in this show, and even those people were quite thrilled by what this episode displayed. But like I've said in every video up until now, sometimes it's impossible to tell whether CGI is being used or not. Case in point, this cut right here that uses 3D movement as a guide for 2D drawings. Let me be clear, doing stuff like this, or age-old rotoscoping for that matter, is no jab at the Genga artist. They're simply doing what works best for them in conjunction with the desired layout. With the sort of stigma that comes along with using technology for 2D movement, it doesn't surprise me if animators are hesitant to show things like this, but I appreciate Yuki Yamashita for doing so. It highlights the near indistinguishable appropriation of rendered movement in the anime space and is more prevalent in the current day than you might think. It's a handy tool, and one that's used seldom depending on its user. If they're good enough at using these tools, then I'd say it's a compliment to the artist that we would never notice this stuff without the production materials. You really don't know what process is hiding behind the completed picture. Now I could go on and on about this like I did in the first video, but I think it would be more interesting to talk about the direction of movement as a whole instead, and how despite lightly following the rhythm of the manga, it sometimes incorporates new actions. Like how the second attack from this devil here sends Denji upwards this time, where he'll land on the leech and then run down it while ripping his pole cord. That's a lot of extra momentum Mamba added, and it creates a much larger gash in the leech devil. It's fitting because this is the strike that will trigger what Denji calls the Battle of Dreams, and set in motion the final and most hardcore action Sakuga this episode has to offer. Not to mention the most scrappy and frantic one as Denji slips his way all around the battlefield. It's desperate looking, yet extremely ferocious, and the feral nature of the camera work supports these moves well. It makes him look like a rapid dog, but a rapid dog that's still got enough common sense to reenact a scene from Star Wars. These cuts are fast and quick, and with the sharp panning work, it showcases just how nimble Denji was when pulling this off. Though maybe he was a little too quick, because he didn't really give himself enough time to figure out a landing procedure, thus opening him up to a large range of eye-gouging attacks. The choreography is obviously in a league of its own, but the demonic energy that Denji emits is held tight all the way throughout the final bout of anime-only choreography where Denji dodges the leech's ground pound attack and goes for some deceptive parkour techniques where he seemingly vanishes into thin air, leaving the leech completely unaware of his presence for a brief moment. It's while looking around for Denji that he emerges from the array of Laffy Taffy and makes a first-person wild arm dash for the leech. This lunge is in the manga, but as you can see, Denji actually grabbed its hair this time. Maybe because his arm is a little too screwed up to do this in the manga. But I'd say that's the least of Denji's concerns, because unfortunately, this is where he loses his dream battle. Such a shame. Just for Denji though, because for the rest of us, seeing Aki summon Khan for the first time was more than we possibly could have asked for. This thing looks sick in color, and while it might only appear briefly, its disappearance brought some real silky smooth smoke effects that not only create a great backdrop, but also work to create a nice reveal for some of the more supporting characters in this show. As you can tell, things are more or less starting to line up shot by panel again, and it makes sense considering that the introduction to these characters should be as faithful as humanly possible. And that includes how Aki inconsiderately yanks Denji off the goopy pavement. Other than that, Aki's arrival pretty much puts a clean wrap on the Leech Devil fight, and boy was it something else. It was the best fight thus far, and we in no doubt have Tatsuya Yoshihara to thank for it, because not only is he the action director for Chain Saw Man, but he was also the acting storyboarder and episode director this time around. I don't think I need to explain how beneficial that is. The fight as a whole was razor focused, and every cut before the next perfectly and unequivocally supported one another. I have no doubt that Yoshihara-san's vision shined its clearest in this episode, and all the other directors and key animators seem to capitalize on this vision flawlessly. Not just for the action segments, but for the quieter moments as well, because we're sure as hell gonna be getting a lot more of them once chapter 10 ends, and we move into the much more chill chapter 11. It's crazy, even when there isn't too much going on, animation is still just as smooth as ever, housing more keyframes than it has any right to while still retaining the integrity of more complicated actions. Like the way Aki skillfully cuts this apple. Things like this didn't need to be done, but in the way they're executed, 
it brings incredible life to the scene, and like I said last episode, also works well to visualize character dynamics and relations. Like here, we can tell that Aki is holding back on his belief of Denji because he just can't figure out why Denji would still hold on to his relationships with fiends and devils. Despite everything he went through, Denji is still treating power as he would any other human, kind of like all the other people that he saved today. And speaking of those people, you might recall that these two here only appeared during that anime only fight sequence last episode, but believe it or not, they are still in the manga. They're the same father and daughter that Denji helped back in chapter 2 during the manga exclusive devil hunting mission. Check out my video on that if you haven't already. For some reason they still appear during Aki's flashback today, but naturally the lines of them that he remembers have been changed to fit the context of how Denji interacted with them. Everyone else's lines are unchanged though, from the shaken office worker to the injured car driver that'll likely start suing later on. So yeah, opinions may be a little mixed on Denji, but it seems like Aki is willing to give him the benefit of the doubt here. I like how that moment is aided with him finally letting Denji eat the apples he made. Though Denji will take Aki's trust of faith with a hint of suspicion. These two may never be on the same page, but at the very least it seems like they've reached a common understanding here. Considering Aki's personality, he's being pretty flexible about all of this, even willing to let power off the leash as well despite her being a true fiend. Perhaps Denji might have rubbed off on Aki more than he likes to admit, which is something that Makima will basically say right to his face later on. But just in the anime, because instead of going right to where power shows up at his house, we're instead treated with over four straight minutes of anime exclusive material. It mostly acts as a calming supplement before power arrives later and lets us immerse ourselves in the meticulously well animated glory of Aki's behavioral patterns. Despite his threatening to Denji about reporting all that happened to the higher ups, he still holds Makima in high enough regard to run through the events of the day with her, and even hints at a plot point that'll be expanded upon a little later. However, the main takeaway here is that with how Aki is covering for two devils, it's quite obvious to Makima that he's being much more flexible than he used to be, even if he doesn't admit it himself. It's not the most important dialogue in the world, but even without any talking, just taking in the background art is enough for me. And not just because Mappa had the wherewithal to animate their characters twice for their reflections, but by how the shoddy windows and imperfect woodwork around them fits so well with the composition of the nightlife shots. The rustic theme of these drawings works wonders in this setting, and emphasizes the real feeling you would get when you're getting ready to go home after a long day of work. And if you're the type of person that loves scenes like this, then these upcoming morning routine cuts are probably right up your alley too. The immediate jump in contrast between the two times of day is quite staggering, and the extra diminished and washed out coloring grounds these cuts for what a typical morning in Japan would feel like. It's quiet, slow, and filled with emerging vitality. This show has always been very gentle with its animation in the more reserved scenes, but never does that style fit better than now. The subtlety in its movements extends beyond the characters and into the objects that they connect with. Make no mistake, everything here is Sakuga in its purest sense. It may not house the same sort of insane movement that action scenes do, but because of that, they have to focus hard on the minute details of how keys flow between one another. It takes a lot of fine precision. Gaps in the movement can get broken in the thick of the action without being noticed too hard, but not for moments that many of us experience every day. These scenes are flexing on a whole other degree, and it's meant to remind us that even when characters aren't doing menial tasks like this, this softer touch to animation is littered throughout the show and has more drawings and the most mundane scenes than ever necessary for a TV show. Everything here just screams the sort of energy you'd feel from a relaxing day off work. That is, at least until you hear a telemarketer bang on your door. Or in this case, a power banging on your door that actually broke down the door handle this time. And that's the rude awakening that puts us back on track with the manga. So much for a relaxing day off. And here Aki thought Denji was difficult to deal with. I'm sure that if it weren't for Makima's smooth talking abilities, Aki would have kicked them both out without a moment's notice. But as it turns out, this will also be a trial of endurance for Denji too, as the anime alone shows that power stole his superbread while Aki was on the phone. Denji may have been a stray coming in as well, but compared to him, power's an unfettered force of nature that seems completely unfit for 
for everyday human life. It's like we're playing back how Aki felt with Denji's arrival, except now he's on Aki's side of the fence. Mappa seems to have mixed up the shenanigans a little bit, but I'm thankful that they decided to draw toilet paper here instead of the alternative. You know Aki's not about to be the one to clean up a devil's poop, so while he takes care of some anime-exclusive laundry, the scrubbing will be left to Denji. Definitely not the way he'd like to spend his night, but before he realized it, this night is about to turn a full 180 when Power comes in to fulfill the promise that she gave Denji. It was such a change of pace that even he was caught off guard. But before things get too underway, Power has some ground rules to lay out for Denji, which don't actually take place in this chapter, but on page 1 of the next chapter. This is the only page for chapter 12 that we'll be covering this episode though, because after she relays her stipulations to Denji, that's when we'll go back to the last page of chapter 11 and Denji can revel at the angel that has fallen before him. My oh my, what a cliffhanger. This episode truly housed the best of both worlds. It had everything the action junkie could ask for and balanced it out perfectly with some relaxing scenes for the more contemplative crowd. Sure enough, not all future episodes will be as perfectly balanced as this one, but whichever way Mappa ends up leaning in the future episodes, I'm sure they'll get it done right. If you guys enjoyed the coverage of this episode, make sure to give the video a like and share with a friend. And also get subscribed for more Chainsaw Man comparison content. I love listening to what you guys think about this show, so leave a comment and tell me what you think so far. Well, that's it for me. As always, I hope you all have a fantastic day. This is Registry, signing off.